I have to say, reading over the uh, careers of the three distinguished panelists, uh, one, I was impressed by how nicely uh, their work, uh, I won't say overlaps, but intersects. Um, and had A.O. Scott been here and chaired this panel, uh, it would have been even nicer. I'm filling in for him as best I can. Um, he certainly missed. Uh, Johannes von Moltke is professor and chair of German and screen arts and culture at the University of Michigan. His PhD is from Duke University, and uh, I'm happy to say he received his BA in comparative literature from this institution. Um, his many books and articles reflect his interest in German cinema, culture, and critical theory. He's written extensively on Siegfried Krakauer, and this past December had a conversation with New York Times film critic A.O. Scott on his uh, new book, um, The Curious Humanist, Siegfried Krakauer in America. Um, so Scott is missed even more. I should also mention that one of his collaborators is Gerd Gemunden, with whom he assembled an interdisciplinary anthology of essays entitled Culture in the Ante Room, The Legacies of Siegfried Krakauer. His current work in progress is Manhattan Transfer, Siegfried Krakauer, Critical Theory, and the New York Intellectuals. Erica Carter began her academic career as a PhD student at the University of Birmingham, working in German and cultural studies. She expanded her interest and branched out from the academy um, to co-found with Chris Turner the translation cooperative Material World. For two years, she was director of talks at the Institute for Contemporary Arts in London, took various positions at British universities, and is now at King's College London, although currently she is visiting honorary professor of German at the University of Nottingham. She chairs the UK German Screen Studies Network and is working with colleagues in Germany, Sweden, and Hungary on a number of collaborative projects. She's published extensively on German cinema, cultural history, including books on gender and consumption, How German Is She?, uh, German Cinema, and Third Reich Aesthetics, Dietrich's Ghosts, and also Early Film Theory, Bela Balash, Early Film Theory. Her current research focuses on the early film theory of Balash and on German-speaking exile academics in Britain and the Empire after 1933. Nicholas Baer completed his PhD in film and media and critical theory at the University of California, Berkeley. Like the other distinguished members of this panel, he has published on German cinema and film theory in numerous journals and anthologies, including a book chapter, Historical Turns on Caligari, Krakauer, and New Film History, and an article on Balash. Together with Anton Case and Michael Cowan, he co-edited The Promise of Cinema, German Film Theory, 1907-1933, University of California Press 2016, uh, which won a couple of very distinguished awards. Uh, it was also uh, reviewed in Film Comment by Noah Eisenberg. Right? <laughs> uh, beginning 
in September 2017, there will be the Collegiate Assistant Professor and Harper Schmidt Fellow in the Society of Fellows at the University of Chicago. So welcome to the three panelists. Thanks, Joanna. And uh, uh, I, I, I have to start on a somewhat personal note because the last time I was in this room was for that conference that you organized on Kakawa, and um, which was the beginning of my work on Kakawa. And then Gad invited me to co-edit the volume. So it feels like it's coming full circle in a really curious way. And the last time I gave that talk, my grandmother was sitting where Jen is sitting. And, uh, Today, my mom's here, so <laughs> this is great. <laughs> so I took Gat and Noah at their uh, request to not write a paper and started taking a lot of notes, which now I'll try to uh, sum, you know, get, get through within 50 minutes. Um, I hope it, uh, it all comes together. It's somewhat um, unformed still, although I'm trying to put this together for a piece that um, will, uh, will appear in the Oxford Handbook on Silent Cinema, for which I've been asked to write about Krakow's silent film criticism. But I won't start there. Since this is a conference about film critique, I thought I'd start with a critic writing, critiquing a critic. Uh, that's Pauline Kael with her unhappy thoughts about um, Krakow's Nature of Film, which was the British release title. The American uh, title was Theory of Film. Um, it's a, it's a faris, we would say in German, a tearing up of the book, or in English, I guess you say a hatchet job, um, which is so damning that it's entertaining. I'm going to read you the first lines. <laughs> Siegfried Krakow is the sort of man who can't say it's a lovely day without first establishing that it is day, that the term day is meaningless without the dialectical concept of night, that both these terms have no meaning unless there's a world in which day and night alternate, and so forth. By the time he has established an epistemological system to support his right to observe that it is a lovely day, <laughs> our day has been spoiled. <laughs> so what follows that beginning is a deeply impatient dismissal of Kakao's attempt to theorize film. And in a way, it's a battle of wits. Um, uh, Kale is uh, uh, full of puns, pointing accusing fingers at Krakauer's pedantry, his Hegelianism, as she calls it. Um, which is as misguided as any criticism you can think of because Kakao hated Hegel. Um, but it's also a battle of positions, which could be sketched in three ways. On the one hand, it's uh, the American pragmatist against the Teutonic dogmatist. She calls him, as I said, a Hegelian. She considers him basically a, a religious zealot when what film criticism needs, in her terminology, is more relaxed men of good sense. That's what Kale wants. The central issue for her is that there's uh, nothing uh, specific to film compared to the other arts, whereas Kakao famously or infamously argues that we have to understand what's specific about film. It's about medium specificity. Um, you could also describe this as a battle between the lumpers and the splitters, with Kale being the lumper and Krakow being the splitter. Secondly, it's a battle of cinephile against cinephile. She likes Cocteau, he likes De Sica. She remembers a small, surreal gesture from one film. He remembers the rippling leaves from another. And thirdly, and uh, this is something that we haven't talked about much yet, and I hope we get to uh, at, at, at a few other junctures today, it's also the battle of the critic against the theorist in this case. Um, she would have us, Kale would have us respond nimbly and without preconceptions to ind individual films rather than get wrapped up in trying to understand or define what cinema is, the nature of film in that title, or to theorize films. Um, because of that, because he tries to do that, Krakauer is simply a pedant whose, quote, best stuff isn't in English. That's a curious <laughs> sentence from Kale because I'm pretty sure she didn't read any of Krakauer's German stuff. Um, <laughs> And in particular, I'm quite sure that she didn't know at the time that Kaka, before theorizing film, was a film critic of many, many years, uh, starting in 1923 um, in Frankfurt, and uh, really for that decade, penning hundreds and hundreds of reviews of, of more than more hundreds of films, because it's often he, he collects films in one review. So I, I don't actually have a count of how many films he reviewed um, over the course of the decade. 
alongside all the other famous essays that he, that he tossed off, um, like the mass ornament and uh, 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 um, uh, the, ones co the essays collected in the mass ornament. Um, so this is uh, something Kale would not have um, been familiar with. Um, and that most of us weren't familiar with until it was collected uh, in the uh, collected works of Kako that have been coming out for the last 10, 15 years, um, uh, where it now appears in, in a three-volume sub-volume. So um, this is basically what I'm going to do is kind of a glorified book report then about that volume that uh, I and I know Nick have been working through. Um, uh, to see what we can glean from the fact. So it's basically what I want to do is give you a few notes on my, on, on my reading of his film Criticism in Toto, like if you go from the beginning to the end and read them sequentially, uh, which I find uh, curiously fascinating. Um, the first point to make about this is, and you can do this, of, of course, Krakow is not alone, right? I'm, just for context, we could talk about Balash that way. Um, uh, although his reviews in the in the in that talk have those been collected and anthologized in sequentially, did uh, no. yeah. Right, right. So the th the thing about Kako as well is really this kind of com absolutely complete. I mean, there's probably one or two that people have missed, but it's really very systematic. In part because he was so systematic about his archive, so he he had his clear map where he kept them all. Um, uh, um, Herbert Ehring working in the Börsenkurier, and of course Rudolf Arnheim uh, um, writing mainly for Die Weltbühne. Um, and there we have these collections and have had them for longer, um, and have them also in English with uh, Arnheim. And, and Nick and I were talking about the fact that we don't have that for Krakow yet. Um, so one of the first things to say about this is how interesting it is to read these in their form as a book, because you can review basically the development of a critic the um, obviousness of particular obsessions or motifs that um, come to the fore and, uh, and assert themselves more strongly over time, and which I'll enumerate, some of which I'll enumerate uh, uh, below. Um, it also, of course, allows us to assess uh, Krakauer's style as he develops it over the, over the decade. Um, as Philip Lopate puts it in, in the introduction to his 2006 anthology that Dana already uh, mentioned yesterday and held up for us, quote, I hope that, uh, I'm sorry, um, film reviewing is a literary performance in the final analysis, and we've talked about this a little bit already. I hope that in some of my, talk, me talking again, some of my translated quotes, if I get to them, it will become apparent that what this means for someone like Kanka, who was a consummate stylist and attended to film reviewing with the same care that he devoted to his novels, as he says in a letter to uh, Adorno, and he did write two novels, in case you didn't know that. Um, uh, second thing to say in, in the first pass at, uh, at this massive volume of reviews is that there are a few special films that stand out, capital S, capital F. You know, they, um, it's, it, other people commented on this, uh, specifically M Miriam Hansen. Um, uh, people who uh, have dealt with Krakauer's film criticism know the importance of a film like Karl Gruner's Die Straße, The Street, um, that really was transformative for him. Um, Another very, very important one is uh, Chaplin's Gold Rush. Chaplin generally, but the Gold Rush in particular is really a touchstone for him. And then uh, in a fascinating way also, predictably, but unpredictably in the way he writes about it, Battleship Potemkin, the Eisenstein film. Um, reading through these reviews, occasionally there's more than one for each of these films. One gets a sense of how momentous the encounter with those films was for Krakoa. They recur as references in other reviews and become touchstones for what cinema is. Die Straße, for example, epitomizes film's ability to convey the tohu wa bohu verdinglichter Seelen und scheinwacher Dinge. The tohu wa bohu, a, a, a mess of reified souls and pseudo-animate objects. Chaplin's Gold Rush shows us the modern subject in all its fragmentation and thereby touches on the world's very existence. That's a quote. And the Potemkin Review is a hymn to cinema's ability to bring surfaces to life while imbuing them with indignation, horror, and hope. And it's really interesting. You should look at this, which is translated in the uh, Promise of Cinema. You should look at this review to see how idiosyncratic his take is on Potemkin. He, he falls in line with the critics at the time, uh, you know, loving it, but he's also reviewing it from a completely uh, specific perspective, perspective, thinking of it as 
uh, as, as uh, seeing it as proof of his developing theory of film as being devoted to surfaces, which is not how we tend to think of Potemkin in the first uh, instance. So in this sense, his, uh, his work is tied up with medium specificity, with the developing film aesthetics. If you did a word count, which we can't do, but the owners of the PDFs probably could do, um, then I'm quite sure that besides articles uh, like the and A, the predominant word would be film gemäß, uh, which means film appropriate or something that film can and therefore should do. So the, the whole idea of medium specificity that we've uh, come to associate with um, film criticism and film theory in particular of what we call the classical uh, phase is, uh, is, is embodied in that word, and it comes up over and over and over again, film gemäß or film gerecht. Um, he's occasionally quite specific about the project of developing over the course of these reviews an aesthetic, noting the lack of a film aesthetics, an aesthetic des films gibt es noch nicht. Um, Krakawa speaks already in one of the earliest reviews of uh, noch ungeschriebene Metaphysik des Films, an as yet unwritten metaphysics of film. Um, I'll get back to this in a minute when I, when I say a few more things about what he considers particularly film gemäß. But first, I want to note um, something uh, kind of diametrically opposed to this importance of the special films, and which is that um, his notion of the medium is ultimately derived, and this really becomes clear if you read across these reviews, not from the special films, but from the recurring fare, from the patterns, the genres, the stereotypes, the detector, detective films, the Hochstaplerfilme or imposter films, the marriage comedies, the city films, the street films, the history films, the adventure films, the fairy tales, slapstick, and edifying films, or Kulturfilme. Um, as Kakoa puts it in the more well-known The Little Shop Girls Go to the Movies, quote, in the endless procession of films, a limited number of typical motifs re recur over and over again. These are so evident and repeat so predictably as to become transparent, as if revealing the true scaffolding underneath. As the decade progresses, Kakawa becomes more and more ironic about plots, as if to suggest that this is not where to look if you're interested in the cinema. As Lopate rightly suggests, and I'll, this is a slightly longer quote from him, working critics have to develop philosophies about trash or bad movies, and strategies for writing about entertaining junk, either by isolating those gifted cameos or enjoyable moments that rise above the general mediocrity, or by employing a variety of ironic, satiric, humorous tones to illuminate the triumph of tripe. That's the end of the quote. I think Kakawa actually did a, a measure of both and perfected it over the course of the 20s. Um, just, uh, just to give you a flavor of what this sounds like uh, in, in his reviews. So already in 1923, this is when he's just starting to review films and um, uh, when uh, film critique uh, by our counting is six years old. Um, um, he writes in, the in a review of Zwischen uh, Flammen und Bestien, quote, um, this is das übliche romantische Eifersuchtsdrama, the usual romantic drama of jealousy. It's already routine. It's already not worth further commenting about. And then my absolute favorite version of this is when he uh, says uh, about a, a film called Das Spielzeug von Paris by a certain Michael Kertesch from 1925 in Austria. In dem Film Das Spielzeug von Paris erlebt wieder einmal eine Tänzerin ein Schicksal. <laughs> and for those of you who don't speak German, in the film Red Heels, that's the American release title, once again, a dancer suffers a fate. <laughs> and I love this because it encodes the whole, the, the whole kind of sensibility with which he's reviewing these films. And, and he, so he walks us through the plots, he mentions them, um, and yet, uh, and it's important, and he gives them the full weight of irony, I think that's important to say too, he doesn't just dismiss them, um, but then he moves on to somewhere else. Or a more, uh, a, a more obvious case, uh, the film, an earlier film um, by different Katesh, uh, Tragödie einer Frau from 1924, is nach uh, bewährtem Rezept gekocht. Its principal in ingredients are an imposter, a woman of loose morals, another woman, and a man caught in between them. And uh, these components to the plot are then, quote, mixed together and enter into a chemical process that yields the expected precipitate. <laughs> Uh, diese Hauptbestandteile werden gemischt und treten zu einem chemischen Prozess zusammen, der den erwarteten Niederschlag zeigt. <laughs> These recurring motifs become the leitmotiv of The Little Shop Girls Go to the Movies, a well-known text uh, 
of Krakauers that caused a sensation in the Frankfurter Zeitung, as Adorno recalled almost 40 years later. Compared to the standalone version anthologized alongside other seminal essays in the mass ornament, that series, The Little Shop Girls, reads quite differently in historical context and against the backdrop of his daily reviewing activities. Um, if you remember, for those of you who know that text, it begins every, every vignette begins with a kind of composite, seemingly composited plot, like a phantom image of a, of a plot. And, and when you read them in the, after having read all the reviews, you realize, oh, no, he's referring to this film, he's referring to that film. So they're all specific films that he'd already reviewed and that he's now returning to to make a more general point about uh, class, gender, and, uh, and audience. Uh, a quick side note on style, and I'm, I'm, I'm going to wrap up in a minute. Um, there's a lot of passive voice in these descriptions. Things are done or are required by these formulaic plots. Reading through these reviews, one recovers a sense, then, of the Weimar film industry as the agent, as the unnamed agent, which churns out generic fare completely divorced from our received image of the art cinema or the cinema of crisis that was already always already political. This is about sentiment and sobriety, about Americanization and the play of surfaces. By the same token, this also gives us access to a lost continent of popular cinema that subtends our view of Weimar as the golden age of German film. Uh, so expressionism, auteurism, Lang, Monau, Papst. This is a very different Weimar cinema that emerges if you read across Kakao's reviews. Um, so now summarizing extremely briefly, the, what's film um, I, I have uh, um, four points on that. The first one simply being that uh, it, he, it receives a negative definition. Film is not theater, not literature, uh, and not all those plots. Because, uh, and I'll linger on this quote for just a moment, I'll give it first to you in German and then in English. Der echte Film zieht ja seine Kraft nie aus der in Worten ausdrückbaren großen Gesamthandlung, Plot sondern stets nur aus der Spannung, mit der seine winzigen Bildeinheiten geladen sind. In English, authentic films draw their power not from the overall action that can be put into words, but from the tension or suspense with which its tiny image units are charged. I think that's an interesting formulation that you could map onto much later ideas about cinephilia, you know, grasping for a little moment in a film from which you kind of then explode the crystal moment. It was one of the films we saw, I think, yesterday, Athen, the Kristall. Uh, that kind of then becomes the, 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 that refracts the entire film, right? That's a very cinephilic uh, take um, on, uh, on cinema. And, uh, and um, it's not the plots. It's not literature. It's not filmed literature. It's not filmed theater. Of course, this is very much in keeping with the times. Um, what is it then? Um, I'm going to have to skip the quotes. It's exteriority, it's surface, it's movement, um, and it's objects. And all these things, of course, come together in slapstick. So his preference for slapstick, which many people have commented on, is it derives, in, I mean, it, it's mutually constitutive. The slapstick helps him formulate his idea about film, and his idea about film then also reinforces his love for slapstick, because that is where objects become autonomous and, uh, and subjectivity gets demoted, gets taken down a notch, um, because you have to contend with the objects that assert their power over uh, the actor, and he even has a whole theory of the MacGuffin already way before Hitchcock, that the film plot starts from nothing and then blossoms. Um, I want to conclude on um, the question of audience in these reviews. Um, Krakow, who would have been uh, keenly aware that he was writing for a bourgeois liberal paper, tends to side for the better part of the 1920s with the audience against all notions of bourgeois pretentiousness, let alone pretensions to art. He had a visceral dislike for art in the movies, for thinking of the movies as art with a capital A. The audience's laughter can justify, that's his term, lowbrow entertainment and historical kitsch, and the critic refuses to dismiss, quote, conventional feelings from middlebrow novels, contending that after all, quote, the audience demands to be satisfied. Um, Kako himself was part of that audience. He was a white-collar worker among white-collar workers and, shop, and among the shop girls with whom he watched the films he would review. And Patrice Petro noted this already a long time ago um, in, um, in her book from 1989 that's called Joyless Streets. Um, 
In this sense, the reviews also have an ethnographic flavor that comes to the fore explicitly and methodologically in Kakao's later study, The Angestellten, which, to, which that too was just a series of articles in a newspaper before it was anthologized as a book. Mm -hmm. But just as in this study, in his review, Kakao again adopts the slightly ironic tone that also distances him, however subtly, from the masses. Adorno would critique this tone as, quote, guileless and at the same time a little arrogant in his um, famous essay, The Curious Realist. But here, the, temp the, uh, the irony in these reviews, I think, is tempered by the dialogic relation between the reviewer and the audience. And there's nothing demeaning in ironic suggestions, such as bring your snow goggles to an alpine film. <laughs> so Kakao is very much uh, aligned with the audience. And then, uh, last note maybe, that does shift over time. Um, because uh, as we move into the 1930s, he becomes a lot less patient with the audience, but largely with the film industry. So he goes after Ufa, and he, uh, he calls out political reaction where he sees it. And it's after all the early 30s, and there is plenty of political reaction. What I can't go into, but would love to discuss, is that if you read through these reviews, um, uh, you, you get early paths that lead in two bifurcating directions, which in my book I actually argue come back together again. Um, one to From Caligari to Hitler, which is that path about calling out political reaction to a fault. And the other to theory of film, which as Rick was telling us, was picked up by the sensibilists and became this idea that you should just relax into those tiny image moments and, and, you know, and the pleasure is more important than the politics. And so both of those tracks are legible in these reviews. Um, and the interesting thing is, of course, where they intersect. And, and I'll stop there, thanks. Presentation, and I'm not 100% sure how oh, we do um, that. Oh, I think you have to escape my. So, how do I do that, do you know? I'm trying to get to. I'm trying to get to this. Yeah, okay. so, yeah. And then probably send it or touch it there. There you go. Okay. Um, right, well that, um, Johannes's two tracks are a great, um, a great beginning for me because that's kind of precisely what I want to talk about um, in relation to Balash. We've, we've been charting over the last um, day and a bit um, various kind of trajectories through film criticism and film theory. So we've talked about the cinephile, we've talked about the cinephobe, we've talked about sociological and political criticism and ideological criticism. Um, and I want to think about Balash today um, as a cinephile critic who is none the less interested in the politics of the aesthetic and to try and think about how he uh, understands that. I think it's fascinating how, um, um, kind of unbeknownst to each other, um, Johannes and I are on a similar track in trying to track something historically through, I'm, I'm trying to do that in the very early stages of trying to do that with Balash in relation to his political aesthetics, but in relation in particular um, to, the, to his thinking about the body. Um, Balash makes very clear um, right from the beginning of his film th theory. So in the interwar period, Balash writes two works of film theory, um, Der Sichtbare Mensch, Visible Man in 1924, and Der Geist des Films, The Spirit of Film in 19. 30, and he makes clear very early on uh, in Der Sichtbare Mensch um, that the issue for him is as much a social as it is an aesthetic issue. So he says of film that it's not just a new art that's come into being. Uh, what he says is far more important is that it's a new human faculty as the possibility and foundation of that art. And so he goes on to say the substrate of the development of film is the subject the human subject, the human in her social being. So he's absolutely clear um, that this is uh, an aesthetic theory in which in some way he's going to try and think about um, the social. And he does that in a variety of ways. First of all, he talks about the human faculty that's come into being with the art of film. And he elaborates on that further on in this passage, Invisible Man, where he talks about, I mean, it's a rather nice 
passage because he talks about how we no longer know how we've come to know this. Um, there are all sorts of things that we now know through film, but we, we kind of know that unconsciously. Um, so we've learned to make, he says, optical associations, inferences, thoughts, abbreviations, metaphors, etc., etc. And this is something he's writing this in the spirit of film. So six years after he writes Visible Man, he says, OK, I'm going to look back six years and I'm going to say, we already know a lot of things that we never knew we could know. And we know those um, through film. So that's the first, um, the first kind of perception that comes from Banash, that human faculties are developing in relation, our way of, uh, of kind of apprehending <coughs> and understanding the world is developing with the technology of film. And then he goes on to talk about um, how that happens and what it means also for our social perception. Um, so in, for example, I mean, Balash is very concerned with um, the body on film. He's also concerned with the close-up as one of the cinematic technologies that, that brings bodies and objects into being in a very different way. And he says, um, this is one of my favorite quotes from Balash. he says, the magnifying glass of the cinematograph, I'm not as tall as Johannes, I've just realized, <laughs> <laughs> brings us closer to the individual cells of life. It allows us to feel the texture and substance of life in its concrete detail. It shows you what your hand is doing, though normally you take no notice. You live in it and pay no attention. So the first thing that film does um, is it, it, it has a kind of perceptual and cognitive function. It brings to your attention things that your body does, that the world does, um, that you were not previously aware of. But secondly, it also brings um, through, largely through the montage, it brings into being the social totalities in which those small um, flashes of insight or that, that, um, that Johannes was just talking about, in which they fit into some kind of orchestrated totality. So we live <coughs> in a social order whose logics and laws are kind of hidden in plain sight. And what film can do is bring some of those logics and laws into into being or into, into perception. Here's one of the metaphors he uses is the metaphor of the orchestra. He talks about how we have been until now bad musicians. Um, I think I'm a bad musician in this sense in that he sort of says what we've heard is just the melody. Um, but if we learn to, but t film can teach us about the orchestra. It can teach us about the elements of the social totality that are brought together amongst other things in the montage uh, to make us understand what it is we live within. Um, so if one thinks, for example, and he talks about this, if one thinks about uh, the City Symphony films, which he talks about in his film writing, they precisely use orchestral methods to bring into being the city as an object of cinematic um, perception. So the city is something that Balash talks about as a kind of field of social action, if you like, that is brought into being or brought into perception through film, um, a space of action, if you like. Um, a second uh, a second object um, is not so much a social field as a social actor, uh, and that's the mass. Um, Balash is famous as um, somebody who, again, like Krakow, there are so many overlaps, uh, although they quarreled um, um, in all sorts of ways. Um, but uh, Balash is also interested in the mass as a social actor who is brought into perception um, and who's, who's and brought into consciousness. I think I think what's important is that for Balash, this kind of bringing into consciousness is also a, a, a political maneuver in the sense that the bringing into consciousness of the city or the mass is the prerequisite for uh, social and political action. Um, so he talks about um, the kind of decorative mass in Lubitsch's historical epics. He talks about um, the kind of agitated and agitatory mass uh, in the montage films of um, Soviet filmmakers. He talks about the dystopian mass um, in films like, um, uh, obviously the obvious one is Lang's Metropolis. Um, and he says that these, 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 Im these images or the kind of mobile mass in film um, brings into consciousness not so much the mass as an object, but the mass as an assemblage of gestures. Um, he's, um, you know, it's, he's absolutely clear that film is a mobile medium, and what we're seeing here um, is um, a set of is a body with a set of gestures and a set of rhythms and movements, which whose directions and again logics um, film can make us perceive. Now. 
it's this, um, it's the, the Balash is writing on the mass. I thought I'd cheer us all up. Um, <laughs> not that we need it, um, but you know, let's just remember and pay tribute for a moment. Um, um, it's, it's this, it's this capacity. I'm, we're going to, we're going to talk, we're, we're going to talk politics for just a minute. Um, uh, it's this kind of bringing into consciousness of the mass by, through a technological medium of mass perception, if you like, and mass representation. That's what's made um, Balash of interest to numbers of critics recently. He's, his work is not at all unproblematic, particularly his understanding of the physiognomy, the face of the mass. We could talk about that in the discussion, but nonetheless, um, writers like Mary Ann Doan are looking at Balash. Um, uh, Laura Heinz has a recent piece, piece in New German critique. Uh, my colleague Isabella Fusi at the University of Seged has written a wonderful piece on Balash and Kaka and, um, and the way in which both of those writers are concerned with the mass as a social actor who becomes perceptible um, through film. Now we obviously also live in an age uh, in which the, the politically active, the mass as social actor is brought into being um, through the operations of uh, in our in our case, the internet and social media. So you all know what this is. These are, these are the mass demonstrations, uh, the feminist demonstrations of January 2017. But you know, this is a kind of recurrent phenomenon. So if you think about uh, rad the movements of the radical right, like Pegida, for example, Pegida started as a Facebook group, um, and the the, uh, the the Monday demonstrations are organised largely, not entirely, but largely through social media. The same is true, for example, of what's going on in Turkey. Uh, Erdogan has eight million followers on social media, and and he uses social media blitzes to bring the mass into being. For example, in defence of his counter coup in July 2016. So the mass is absolutely something that is called into being through the mediation uh, these days of social media. Obviously, this is different um, from uh, what's happening in the 20s and 30s. Um, but nonetheless, this seems, to be, this seems to be one reason for looking at Balash to see how he understands uh, how film plays a part in, um, pr in producing a perception of a social actor who may be Oh, this is just, I wanted to show you one of my favorite photos, which is of our uh, self-avowed feminist uh, Muslim mayor, Sadiq Khan, p p uh, participating in one of the, min the, the women's marches. So this is him singing, singing along to Sister Sledge, We Are Family, in the London <laughs> demonstration. I thought you might like to see that, so that's just... But that does kind of set the tone um, for <laughs> what I want to say now about social actors and the mass, which is that... There are, there are always individual bodies that come to, in some way, stand as an emblem of the mass, or this seems to be one of the ways in which we understand um, larger social movements. Um, earlier this week, I was kind of delighted and very thankful to see the Guardian newspaper publish, publishing an article on women and the visual imagination of mass protest. This is a photo taken earlier this week um, during an anti-Muslim demonstration by the English Defence League in Birmingham. That's a, 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 a movement of the radical right. Uh, in, this is in a city which has a population of over nearly 20, it has a nearly 22% Muslim population. So the EDL going on the streets of Birmingham is a very provocative act. And this is a young woman, Sophia Khan, who is staring down an EDL member after having stepped in to help a woman who's being jostled, jostled by, by the mass. Um, and Iqbal, the Guardian journalist, ponders in her piece what it is about this image that makes it go viral on social media globally. And she says, well, for one thing, it's the fact that this is an image of woman. Um, so she says there's something irresistible about seeing a perfectly framed shot in which brute aggressive force is upturned and subverted by a simple and graceful gesture. Gesture Again, a young protester casually using a policeman's shield as a mirror to apply her lipstick, as here, this is Macedonia to 2015, an elderly woman sitting cross-legged and smiling in front of the, a wall of soldiers. This is Seoul, an anti-government protest in April 2015 or Aisha Evans, who knew there was more power in calm when she approached the police in Baton Rouge last summer. Um, so that's a quote from Noshin 
Iqbal. So what we have in these photos, as Iqbal rightly notes, are the traces of a political imaginary in which the gesture of a single or the gestures of a single woman become the visual figure for a defiant or rebellious or simply socially autonomous democratic mass. Um, and this is where we come back in this notion of the visual gesture that embodies um, a social imaginary. This is where we come back to um, Balash's understanding of the body on film. Um, like uh, like um, Johannes, although I think I'm quite a bit further behind with this project than, than he is because I haven't trawled through the reviews, but um, I've just been looking back over um, Visible Man and the Spirit of Film and trying to trace a history of Balash's understanding, not of the mass, but of the individual figure, and in particular, the individual figure of um, the woman. Um, and I, I think I want to say two things about this. One, one is that um, Balash understand. I mean, he, he writes a lot about, about performance. He writes a lot about female performance. And I think it, what's, what's very interesting about looking, at, looking back over his work is that you can see him tracing a history of the body and a history of the performance, of, of, of embodied performance. So as he, as he says in the quote that I gave you right at the beginning, it, a human faculty is developed by film and it has a history, it has a historicity. So there's no such thing as a body that simply subsists outside of time. Um, the body is transformed and in, and in turn transforms the medium um, of film. And then uh, what I've identified so far is kind of four moments or movements in the development of the history of performance which can be extracted from Balash's writing in the interwar years. So he starts off, um, and I'm not going to show you, or I might just, I might just let this run, not that one, but no, it's not going to, it's not going to go. Um, uh, it, it, famously, um, Balash's kind of first emblem of um, the kind of extraordinary quality of female performance on film is Asta Nielsen. And he talks about Asta Nielsen um, as a, an, a film artist um, who has developed this historical capacity of the body. Could you make sure that this is on mute? Um, who has developed, yes it is, who's developed this historical capacity of the body um, to capture social gesture and to give it back to the audience on film. Um, and he says of Asta Nielsen that she's developed a whole gesturology, a whole le lexicon of gestures um, that absolutely encapsulate um, what's happening to the body uh, in this early 20th century moment uh, in which the body is becoming increasingly mediatized. So the first, the first body that you have in Balash is the expressive body of Asta Nielsen. This is Asta Nielsen in a wonderful film fragment that we have, the film Prima Donna, in which he's playing the film star um, Ruth Breton, and here she's, as you can see, inspecting the rushes from the day's filming and saying, no, absolutely not, I will not have that. Um, um, so she's taking, I mean, and this is kind of a metaphor, if you like, although I've said the body isn't a metaphor, but she's, you can see what she's doing. She's saying, I know what I'm doing, and this is how I want to become the image on film. I'll just let you glory in this for a moment. So it went, okay, so this is, this is the expressive body on film. Yeah. <laughs> Good, I'm glad I showed that. Um, okay, so that's Asta Nielsen and the expressive body. There are three further, and I'm wrapping up now, um, I won't play the other clips. There are three further kind of mode, performance modes, um, which I think um, begin to emerge if, if one starts to read Balash as uh, Johannes was reading Krakow sequentially. There's the modernist body, or more specifically, the modernist face. Um, so uh, in, there's a very lyrical passage again where Balash talks about the face of Lillian Gish in Way Down East, where she discovers that she's just discovered she's pregnant, and then she's talking to the man she's married, she thinks she's married, and then she finds out that they are in fact not married. So she becomes in that moment a fallen woman, a pregnant woman, um, who is not, who is, whose child will be born out of wedlock. And Balash describes the simultaneity of the emotions that pass across her face. So there's shock, there's horror, there's despair, there's hope, there's kind of stupefaction. Um, and he talks about uh, Gish's use of the face, of facial uh, gesture, 
um, uh, it, it, as, as a kind of modernist poem, he's very interested in Walt Whitman. He's very interested in simultaneity in Walt Whitman. Uh, and he sees Lillian Gish's face as a kind of, if you like, a kind of, modern, uh, a kind of plastic realization of the principles of modernist poetry. Well, that's how I read Balash in that, that um, section on Gish's face. So there's the expressive body, there's the modernist body. There's also, uh, and I think this is interesting, towards the end of the 1930s, he's begin to, beginning to write about the impassive face. And talking about how the impassive face, for example, of Sesue Hayakawa, um, the Japanese-American actor, uh, he says in impassivity points towards a state of crisis, a state of crisis that he identifies um, in, in this moment in, in the late 1920s, early 30s, and that can be kind of realized in a face that points to in which um, the, the nature of that crisis is invisible but evident. That's a very fine distinction, but I think it's an interesting distinction. It's made me think a lot, for example, about Sandra Huller's performance in the recent Tony Erdmann, where she again, I think, uses impassivity to talk about the state of crisis in global capitalism, uh, which, she is, which her figure of a business consultant is representing in that film. And then finally, there's the mask um, as another kind of face, a face face in what James Narrimore calls, and various other people have called, ostentive performance, the mask that presents itself as artifice uh, and deconstructs um, the, the way in which it itself performs here, femininity. So the mask, I, I'm very, I'm, I've been working recently on Hannah Shigula, who is absolutely a kind of, uh, you know, she, she glories in ostentive performance, if you like. But this is, I thought I would leave you with the, this political image of a woman who is using a mode of ostentive performance, putting on her lipstick um, in using a police shield as a mirror, um, to assert herself as a political actor in public space. So I think what I'm saying in, in sum is that one can trace through um, Balash's writing a history of changing modes of performance in their relationship to um, to social and political change, uh, and that that m might give us a way of thinking about political actors in the present. Thank you very much. Thank you so much to Joanna for uh, moderating the panel and uh, to Garrett and Noah for organizing such a wonderful conference. Can everyone hear me? Yeah. Great. Um, so uh, at the conclusion of his book, Better Living Through Criticism, film critic A.O. Scott writes, the horizon of perfection is as far away as it has ever been, and therefore the work of criticism, properly understood, is endless. So taking its cue from Scott, my presentation today will examine the concept of aesthetic perfection and consider its place in the history of film criticism. So is there such a thing as a perfect film, or does perfection only serve as an unattainable ideal? What constitutes imperfection in film, and on what basis can critics make claims about the shortcomings of particular works? So I'm interested in um, the way in which perfection is a term that continues to circulate in film discourse. And if you look at movie criticism, uh, certainly advertisements, you see the term perfect or perfection thrown around a lot. And I guess I'm interested in what perfection actually means in relationship to cinema in a kind of philosophical sense, and what role the concept of perfection serves in both film theory and film philosophy. And that's what I'll be exploring tentatively in my remarks today. So while, as A.O. Scott indicates, perfection serves as a kind of limiting concept uh, for film criticism, the term has nearly disappeared from film scholarship, especially in the wake of efforts to uh, establish the study of cinema as a legitimate discipline and also to challenge prior accounts of the medium's emergence and development. In film history, theory, and practice from 1985, Robert Allen and Douglas Gomery issued a critique of two of the earliest American works of film historiography. Robert Grau's uh, The Theater of Science from 1914, and Terry Ramsey's A Million and One Nights from 1926. Among the common characteristics of the two works in Alan Gomery's analysis is a teleological narrative, and I quote from them here, film history for them is a story of the steady, inevitable <coughs> progress towards technological and aesthetic perfection. Oh, speak up, okay, thank you. Does this help? <laughs> 
OK. <laughs> so Alan Gomery's work was foundational for the new film history that has significantly expanded and nuanced our understanding of cinema over the past three decades. Thanks. Nevertheless, in reducing the concept of perfection to an issue of teleology, their work elides, I think, its crucial and complex position in the history of film criticism. So in what follows in my remarks today, I want to argue that cinema challenged classical conceptions of perfection and contributed to a modernist redefinition of the term, suited for technological modernity. Furthermore, I will suggest that it is in the age of cinema that perfectionism emerges as a form of obsessional neurosis. So section one, classical conceptions. Among the major developments in modern aesthetic theory is the gradual decline of classical conceptions of aesthetic perfection. While 18th century German philosophers Christian Wolff and Alexander Baumgarten had transposed perfection to the realm of aesthetics, where it was identified with beauty, Immanuel Kant's critique of the power of judgment from 1790 provided a more differentiated understanding of perfection, here differentiated or viewed as independent from the judgment of taste. In the 19th century, perfection came to appear as an unreal concept and was increasingly dismissed by movements that prioritized expression over prevailing neoclassical standards. By 1916, Georg Lukács could claim in his theory of the novel that the perfection of the Greek world is now both unthinkable and separated from us by an unbridgeable gulf. Early 20th, early 20th century theorists juxtaposed classical aesthetics not only with the modern novel, however, but also with the latest technological media. In Creative Evolution from 1907, Henri Bergson differentiated between modern and ancient conceptions of time with reference to instantaneous photography and sculpture. Drawing a similar comparison, Walter Benjamin devoted an entire section of his 1936 essay, The Work of Art in the Age of His Mechanical or Technological Reproducibility, to the opposition between film and ancient Greek art. And I provide a longer quote from that text here for us to consider together. Film, he writes, has given crucial importance to a quality of the artwork which would have been the last to find approval among the Greeks, or which they would have dismissed as marginal. This quality is its capacity for improvement. The finished film is the exact antithesis of a work created as a single stroke. It is assembled from a very large number of images and image sequences that offer an array of choices to the editor. These images, moreover, can be improved in any desired way in the process, leading from the initial take to the final cut. To produce A Woman of Paris, which is 3,000 meters long, Chaplin shot 125,000 meters of film. The film is therefore the, art, the artwork most capable of improvement, and this capability is linked to its radical renunciation of eternal value. This is corroborated by the fact that for the Greeks, whose art depended on the production of eternal values, the pinnacle of all the arts was the form least capable of improvement, namely sculpture, whose products are literally all of a piece. In the age of the assembled or motir by artwork, the decline of sculpture is inevitable. So I think this quote is amazing for a lot of reasons that I want to tease out uh, now. I think Benjamin should be placed in an aesthetic trajectory extending back to 18th century German art historian uh, Johann, Joachim, Johann Joachim Winkelmann, who had celebrated the utmost perfection of ancient sculpture. Here, I think, though, he's reframing neoclassical accounts within a kind of technological determinist argument, suggesting that Greek art was kind of crafted for all eternity because of its limited potential for reproducibility, while film, on the other hand, is defined, of course, by its mass reproducibility and capacity for improvement. And the German he uses is for Besserungsfähigkeit. Benjamin illustrates this contrast with reference to a key difference, of course, in material form. Whereas a sculpture is a unified piece of marble or bronze, film is assembled from heterogeneous images that can be endlessly reconfigured by a montage. And we can think here of common practices such as compilation or found footage films, director's cuts, uncensored versions, or even the mashups that have become uh, popular on YouTube and other digital platforms. So in contradistinction to a range of commentators uh, from Jean Renoir and André Bazin to Bordwell, Steiger, and Thompson, Benjamin thus argues that film breaks with classical aesthetics through its industrial conditions of production, as well as its capacity to be improved at every stage of production. Repurposing a passage from his earlier text, Chaplin, in retrospect, Benjamin exemplifies the opposition between classical art and film through the figure of Charlie Chaplin, who is notorious, of course, for his endless takes and his exorbitant shooting ratios. What Benjamin, I think, is thus tracing in this quote is a shift from the aesthetic perfection of ancient Greek art, noted for its eternal validity, to perfectionism and obsessional neurosis here associated with the, uh, with the endless possibilities and provisional nature of film form. 
Before I turn, though, to the figure of the film director as perfectionist, I first want to consider how the concept of perfection became redefined in the modern age of machines. So I'll turn now to the second of my three sections. For many early 20th century critics, cinema appeared as a mere tool for faithfully capturing and reproducing the visible phenomena of the contemporary world, or in Paul Valéry's words, an external memory endowed with mechanical perfection. Eager to integrate the new medium into the traditional category of art, various theorists and practitioners defined filmmaking in terms of artisanal craftsmanship and highlighted the formative aspects of the production process. Others, however, celebrated cinema as a modern technologically based art form that deploys collective and industrial methods of production and engages with material reality. In these latter accounts, the concept of perfection shed its classical connotations and became newly defined in terms of mechanization. So the image of perfection, I think, shifted from the ancient Greek sculpture to the well-oiled functioning machine, in a sense. This machine aesthetic, I want to say, is evidenced by a number of modernist movements, whether we think of Italian futurism or the technological romanticism of both Weimar and Nazi Germany. But I want to here focus on Russian constructivism, and especially the figure of Soviet filmmaker and theorist Siga Veritov. In Kinoch's a Revolution from 1923, Veritov heralded the film camera as a mechanical kino eye that significantly improves upon human vision. And I provide here a quote from his text from 1923. We therefore take as the point of departure the use of the camera as a kino eye, more perfect than the human eye, for the exploration of the chaos of visible, visual phenomena that fills space. The kino eye lives and moves in time and space. It gathers and records impressions in a manner wholly different from that of the human eye. The position of our bodies while observing or our perception of a certain number of features of a visual phenomenon in a given instant are by no means obligatory limitations for the camera, which, since it is perfected, perceives more and better. We cannot improve the making of our eyes, but we can endlessly perfect the camera. So the camera's infinite perfectibility here thus contrasts with the perennial weakness of the human eye, overcoming its imprecision and limited spatiotemporal parameters. Anthropomorphizing the camera lens and lending it the first person voice, Veritov goes on to write, I am kino eye. I create a man more perfect than Adam. I create thousands of different people in accordance with preliminary blueprints and diagrams of different kinds. I am kino eye. From one person, I take the hands, the strongest and most dexterous. From another, I take the legs, the swiftest and most shapely. From a third, the most beautiful and expressive head. And through montage, I create a new perfect man. So here, Veritov envisions, I think, the creation of a perfect human being through the technique of montage, which can abstract and reassemble parts from different individuals. Whereas the prior quote from Veritov had focused on just the human eye, he here suggests the possibility of perfecting the entire human body. And indeed, two years later, in 1925, he would extend his discussion of optical media to consider new sound technologies, which could record every noise with utmost precision or perfection. Whereas Veritov celebrated the mechanical perfection of film and other media, Western Marxist theorists emphasized, the per that, emphasized that perfection remains dubious under conditions of capitalism. So making explicit reference to Marx, Bela Balash argued at the end of Visible Man, 1924, that the manifold imperfections of film emerge from the contradiction between the abstraction of capitalism and cinema's proclivity for the concrete, immediate, uh, uh, non-conceptual experience of things. For theorists associated with the Frankfurt School, perfection bore a more sinister function as a form of commodity fetishism. Thus, Siegfried Krakauer observed the flawless appearance of the film diva and sarcastically noted the inherent imperfections of nature in relationship to the controlled studio set. Perhaps most famously, though, Max Horkheimer and Theodor Adorno took aim at a culture industry that lends all products a kind of machine-like technical perfection that is at once rationalized and barbaric. And I have a quote here from the Dialectic of Enlightenment. The culture industry has abolished the, rubber of, the rubbish of former times by imposing its own perfection, by prohibiting and domesticating dilettantism. And we talked uh, in Johannes' presentation about this concept of trash or rubbish um, in terms of trash productions that they here um, integrate into their analysis of the culture industry. It is against, I think, this backdrop that Adorno later returned to the subject of film, of course, in his 1966 essay, uh, Transparencies on Film. And there, he famously preferred the kind of amateurish or unprofessional quality of young German cinema as opposed to the kind of perfectly polished, immaculate output of the commercial film industry. So let me turn now just to my final section, The Perfectionist. Even if perfection had become, uh, let's see here. 
Even if perfection had become an ideological fetish of the culture industry, the term also served as a true, if unattainable, ideal for Adorno. In his posthumously published Aesthetic Theory from 1970, Adorno wrote, and I quote, art cannot fulfill its concept. This strikes each and every one of its works, even the highest, with an ineluctable imperfectness that repudiates the idea of perfection towards which artworks must aspire. So for Adorno, all artworks are necessarily imperfect insofar as they form the nexus of irreconcilable elements, namely mimetic magic and secular rationality. If, as Adorno suggests, artists must uphold an ideal of perfection that is inevitably negated and ultimately unreachable, I think we have a scenario ripe for a frustrated and repressed impulse, or what Sigmund Freud had famously called neurosis. Now, Freud had indeed the theorized perfection in a range of texts from a narcissism to civilization and its discontents, but it is in Beyond the Pleasure Principle that he offers his most extended account of the term. Here, Freud dismisses the postulate of a perfectionist instinct at work in humankind, which Kant had assumed as part of a universal plan in human nature. Observing this instinct only in certain individuals, Freud argues, and I have a quote here from Beyond the Pleasure Principle, what appears in a minority of human individuals as an untiring impulsion towards further perfection can easily be understood as a result of the instinctual repression upon which is based all that is most precious in human civilization. The repressed instinct never ceases to strive for complete satisfaction, which would consist in the repetition of a primary experience of satisfaction. No substitute of a reactive formations and no sublimations will suffice to remove the repressed instinct's persisting tension. And it is the difference in amount between the pleasure of satisfaction which is demanded and that which is actually achieved that provides the driving factor which will permit no halting at any position attained, but in the poet's words, presses ever forward, unsubdued, or in German, ungebendigt immer vorwärts trinkt. So for Freud, it's a very interesting, I think, reading that he's giving us here of the perfectionist personality type, um, where he's saying that perfection is less the source of human development than an outcome of the repression upon which the heights of civilization are themselves founded. So Freud is thus offering us a kind of vision of the perfectionist, not as the uncompromising romantic genius, but actually as a profoundly regressive figure who's incapable of giving up the full satisfaction that was still possible in early childhood or infancy. So in Freud's diagnosis, perfectionism represents a repressed instinct's ongoing demand for gratification that presses forward ever unsubdued. And that's a quote that is, of course, borrowing from Goethe's Faust. And I think I, oops, I, th I think I somehow lost a page, but I could certainly improvise. <laughs> um, let me see really quickly. <laughs> In his, um, in his 1937 text, um, uh, Paul Valéry wrote, the aim for to aim for perfection, to dedicate unlimited time to a work, to propose as Goethe wished an impossible goal, these are all intentions that the system of modern life tends to eliminate. Now, I actually want to argue against Valéry, um, who's suggesting that perfectionism, in a sense, is eliminated by the conditions of modernity. And what I want to argue instead is that perfectionism actually only emerges in modernity in relationship to the costs means and pace of production in an industrial process. Um, and I think an exemplary figure in this regard is, of course, the filmmaker who's constantly coming up against economic, technological, institutional constraints and working, of course, with the cast and crew. And um, the example I wanted to give, since we're talking about Faust here, is, of course, uh, F.W. Murnau's 1926 uh, film version of Faust, um, which was shown briefly in the film that uh, Rick introduced for us last night. And I chose this particular image because um, Murnau famously uh, insisted that this shot be filmed uh, almost a thousand, or almost a hundred times. And Lotte Eisner writes about this in her book on Murnau, um, and which we'll probably discuss later today as well, um, but uh, that he apparently you know, drove everyone crazy, insisting that the shot be done over and over again until the pact with the devil was successfully filmed. <laughs> Um, and so what I think is in interesting is that, um, of course, Freud is theorizing perfection in the early 20th century at the very moment when you have the first kind of notoriously perfectionist directors, whether we think of Murnau, Chaplin, um, Fritz Lang, Stroheim, all the way through Hitchcock, um, uh, Kubrick, and even Werner Herzog in a sense. And what I want to suggest in closing and to kind of pose for discussion are, two, I guess, two points. One is that, of course, um, the concept of aesthetic perfection uh, was, of course, challenged by film and which shifted us from a kind of classical conception of the term 
that Benjamin outlined uh, associated with Greek sculpture to a more modernist conception, um, whereby perfection becomes defined in terms of a kind of perfectly uh, functioning, well-oiled machine. At the same time, I, I want to suggest that the figure of the perfectionist film director becomes a kind of exemplary figure for us, um, insofar as his kind of obsessional neurosis, and unfortunately usually a he, um, gives, I think, a kind of perfect example of uh, perfectionism um, as both a kind of condition of possibility and impossibility of film aesthetics. So I'll end there, and I look forward to the discussion. Thank you. Need the mic for recording. Good. Uh, so. We open it up to discussion. Maybe the <laughs> panelists want to respond to each other initially. Let's okay. Let's thank you. Um, thank you all for great presentations. I have a question for Erica, and I'm hoping you can just elaborate on this a bit because um, it seems that Balash's preference is for subtle expressions, and I'm mm. thinking about the microphysiognomy of the close-up, the face beneath the face, and this impassive uh, face that he privileges. Um, and the images that you showed of the, the contemporary protests are also images of calm and, and quiet. Mm -hmm. But I'm wondering about overt expressions and things like female rage. Um, where does that fit in Balash's theorization of um, the gesture and, and the female body in particular? I think you're absolutely right that he favours the um, he favours the, the non-expressive expression, if you like, because what he's interested in is not the expression of a state of mind, but if you like, the expression of an experience. So he's interested when he's writing about the face of Gish. He's interested in the experience of time that's produced by. So that's why he's you know for him it's about simultaneity. It's not about the shock that she expresses, but it's about the experience of a, of a temporality, a kind of arrested moment in time in which, in which different experiences clash, if you like. And he's also interested in relation to, the, to that, I'm just giving you that example. Um, he's interested in the kind of collapsing of space into time so that the close-up takes away the surrounding space um, and, and everything is the time of the moment, if you like. So, so I think that he... Um, I think I can't think of an example. Other people will correct me, but I can't think of an example where he talks about rage. And certainly, he wouldn't be interested in the emotion that's expressed. He would be interested in the figure um, and how it embodies um, a state of a state of being in time and space. I suppose. Uh, and you're right. He doesn't like. He really doesn't like the mask. Um, he thinks he calls it fakery. Um, so he's not interested in a mode of performance that calls attention to itself as performance. Um. Um, th thank you for those presentations, which each of them were excellent. Um, I had two short comments: one for uh, Nick um, and one for Johannes. Um, Nick, I, I wondered um, whether you have thought about where that tradition goes after this period. And I mean, the only contemporary example that I can think of is something like the uh, uh, Victor Perkins kind of uh, school and his followers. So film is film and, and people like uh, Andrew, Andrew Clavin uh, and Alex Clayton, things like that. So something about that. The second was for Johannes. Um, it was a really um, uh, 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 great parallel with the, the Poland Kale. I mean, when uh, Annette Mickelson had a very scathing uh, obituary of, of Pauline Kale in an art forum, she kind of blamed Pauline Kale for everything that's wrong with uh, film culture. And she said, well, um, Kale is to blame for the division between uh, film theory and film criticism. And of course, she was also blamed by Jonathan Rosenbaum for um, uh, the lack of foreign films in the United States. So she's been blamed for everything. But I, I, think, I, I think the reason for uh, Kale's uh, hatred of, of, uh, of, of Krakawa uh, was not just because of her basic repulsion to, to theory, but because there was a, a somewhat of a similarity be between them, uh, unlikely as it is. And that is what I think it, it is was... Um, 
they both, and you illustrate this in your reading of the, of the reviews of, of Krakow, that th th they were both trying to um, negotiate a certain relationship with, with, with the audience. And that was, as you said, a kind of a, a conspiracy of the, of the critic and his reader at the expense of a supposed elites or supposed industry or, or something, something else. And you see this uh, in, in Krakow, but you see this also, for example, in Louis de Luc. In, uh, in, in France. You see this in this country with someone like uh, Gilbert Seldes. And of course, you see this very prominently with, with Kale. And, and I, I, I just wondered if that was something that, uh, I guess, something you, you agree with. And also, this idea of the, of the trajectory of, of the reviews, I think that maybe that could also be explained by something we see in many critics, which is they become absolutely exhausted. <laughs> The daily practice of a critic seeing film after film, year after year, you see this in many critics, they become quite cynical. And vis-a-vis and -vis the, the industry. Sorry? Every critic in the room cracked up. When you oh, said that. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, that's uh, thank you very much for the question. Um, certainly, yeah, can, I thought it's a very, it's a kind of MB over project. And, um, <laughs> I was thinking about these figures that first emerged in the 1920s, these kind of famously difficult directors, um, and you know, Chaplin, Murnau, Lang, um, Stroheim with Greed, it's, you know, um, and, but certainly there's an extended tradition of this, and um, I was just teaching Suleiman, who I think um, uh, was mentioned yesterday, and he's famous for just, you know, uh, being extraordinarily particular about where the camera goes in each shot in ways that make him apparently very hard to work with. Um, I guess the point that I was, um, I guess that I was interested in exploring was um, I guess arguing against Paul Valéry, and actually Krakow cites Valéry, which is how I got the reference in the epilogue to um, Theory of Film. And uh, you know, Valéry's argument is, of course, that perfectionism is basically no longer possible in modernity um, because there are all these constraints working against you um, that don't give you the time um, to really work on a uh, project endlessly. And the, I was thinking that's totally undialectical because, in a sense, the perfectionist can only emerge in modernity when it's defined against all these factors and forces that um, that you're trying to push up against. And so, only and the filmmaker I'm interested in is a kind of figure who is so exemplary in that regard. Partly because the filmmaker is dealing with technological uh, constraints, um, dealing, of course, with economic forces, dealing with a studio that's imposing various limitations in terms of content, etc. Um, and then, you know, um, and this goes back to our discussion about tourism from yesterday as well, who's constantly collaborating. It's always a team effort in ways that um, challenge traditional notions of authorship, subjectivity, intentionality, et cetera. So in that sense, film, I think, um, and there are many other ways in which it does so, really challenges kind of, you know, the con conception of the perfectionist. And so it's the director who wants to assert total control over work at, you know, in spite of everything um, that goes into the medium is, I think, a kind of interesting figure that I'm interested in tracing and, and a trope that I'm suddenly seeing is everywhere in classical film theory. Um, yeah, um, it's on. Um, uh, thanks for the opportunity to come back to uh, Kale, which I didn't do at the end of the talk, but had meant to. Um, because I think you're, you're right. I, actually, I think that, I don't know what the critics in the room will say to this, but that a, a lot of what, what we then pull out of the criticism and how we try to position different critics against each other or see battles forming, et cetera, it's often about the narcissism of small differences. <laughs> and, um, and I think this, obviously, this could not have been apparent to Kale because <laughs> your own psychology can't be apparent to you, but also because Theory of film is a kind of condensed version of, of, of a lot of thinking. Krakow was, you know, famously worked it over and over and over for many, many years, certainly too many years. Um, but if you unfold it, unspool it backwards and go back to the Weimar criticism, you find the, that same relaxed man of good sense whom Kale is looking for. Um, and by that, I'm trying to suggest that there is, a, that th this is about pragmatism. Um, obviously, avant la lettre, it's, you know, he hasn't read Dewey yet, although he does read Dewey for theory of film, which I find is really interesting. Um, but there's a sense that uh, uh, responding to art is about experience and the messiness of experience and not the rigidity of theory and certainly not dogmatic. And that's something you can, and, and that's about the relationship between the audience and the critic and the filmmakers. 
Um, and in that sense, I think there's, there is a kind of, I mean, I wouldn't say he, you know, he's writing like Cale in the 20s, but there is something where you can draw lines from his writings and that those moments that you have to explode and just focus on and not have some preconceived notions about the industry or what film should be, that you know, every time you come to a film fresh, those kinds of ideas that he shares with a lot of American uh, film crit critics later, it's just not, not accessible to us. And I think this category of experience is, um, is, is quite central uh, to that. Um, I take your point, uh, point about exhaustion, which is also something that came out uh, in the movie last night. I think Aitin, somebody mentions it about Aitin that all the old critics get tired. And um, I'll, 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 th I'll keep that in mind as I continue reading through these. I am pretty wedded to the idea that there's a politics also, a political atmosphere in which the, the anger uh, uh, takes hold that's not just personal, right? So that, you know, in 19, writing in 1931 or two about the movies is different than writing about in 1923 or four about the movies for, for real. <laughs> Um, building on what you've just been talking about, Johannes, and, and on Matthias's question, I, I, I had one a question for all of you, actually, and it really has to do, and I'm really happy for this panel because it uh, allowed a chance to really allow us to reflect on the relationship between film criticism, criticism and film theory. Right. And I think, in particular, when we think about Krakauer and Balash and, you know, Arnheim as well, these are all people who started out as practicing film critics mm -hmm whose work then somehow found its way into these film theoretical statements, you know, in, in, into, um, you know, The Visible Man, into um, Film as Art from 1932. Um, and obviously, with, in Krakauer's case, you know, his film criticism found its way both into From Caligari to Hitler and Theory of Film in different kinds of ways. And I guess the question is really, I mean... <laughs> What, do you want to say that when film critics get exhausted, they become film theorists? <laughs> or, um, <laughs> um, or, I mean, probably less glibly, less, less glibly how, how are we to account, I think, conceptually, and also in terms of, let us say, film criticism, in terms of its evidentiary quality, for the way, what happens to criticism when it's raised to the power of theory? Well, we'll talk about that tonight when we talk about Tony Scott's book, which is, <laughs> which has been accused of exactly that. <laughs> um, uh, I don't, I don't have a ready answer. I think it's a, it's a great, um, great point to raise. And I've often thought, sticking for a moment with Kakoa, that uh, one problem with theory of film is that it announces something in its title, namely, "I'm going to be a theory." when it might be more profitably read as criticism. Mm. I think a lot of that book is really film criticism mm. and um, trying out different predilections. And so it, it becomes contradictory internally. It becomes overly dogmatic at other moments. Um, and that, that, kind of, that dissipates if one reads the criticism back into the theory and uh, reads it as, uh, as a critical enterprise. That's, uh, that's not really an answer. I mean, I, I think the, the relationship between Criticism and theory is one that, in a sense, dogs our field, and that's the topic of this conference, right? I mean, it was Fatima's title, uh, uh, Film Wissenschaft versus Film Kritik. That's, th th there's the rub. <laughs> I think it's well put. Um, on Balash, I, I just I think it's interesting that he starts Visible Man with with a triple preface. So he he addresses the art historians and the aestheticians, and he addresses the audience, and he addresses film practitioners. And he sort of says, look, we've got to take this medium seriously, and I'm going to show you how to do it. Um, I'm going, so so I think there's a kind of strategy of legitimation uh, that goes on with, with, the, with the shift into theory. That would be probably a first answer. And the second answer in Balash's case is that he does then try to use Visible Man um, as a way of talking politically and talking about the way that the entry of the body into this kind of mass medium of representation as the vehicle of you know, universal expression and so on, that's the way he puts it, um, is a way of challenging capitalist abstraction. So he tries to make film theory into a social theory at that point. So I guess those are two impulses for Balash, which are less easily expressed in his criticism, I, I guess. I guess one, one final thing I would add is um, 
I mean, partly what I take issue with is a certain mode of periodizing the history of film theory that's um, become somewhat canonized, and, uh, especially, for example, in the work of Francesco Cassetti, um, who says that there was a kind of early film theory um, pre-1920, which was largely informal, um, on the fly, uh, and then by 1920, something like a kind of classical film theory emerges, which continues until 1960 with theory of film and some of Bazan's and uh, final writings. and. Um, what has always bothered me is how squarely that maps onto a Bordwellian um, way of telling the history of film as well, where you have uh, the pre-classical, the classical, and the post-classical or post-studio era. And um, I find it profoundly dissatisfying, partly because uh, 1920 to 1960 was anything but a stable period when you think about the, both the history of film um, uh, and the sets of issues that people like Balash, Krakauer, um, and Arnheim and others were actually dealing with in terms of shifts in the medium and also um, shifts in economic and uh, political uh, developments as well. And so uh, it's, I think maybe it's time to rethink our mode of periodizing uh, film history um, uh, and film theory, and maybe that would be a way of breaking down some of these distinctions that we have between film criticism and film theory as well, I would say. Could I just add one on? Yeah, um, I, I just wanted to add one thing about about style, actually, and about the style of writing, because one of the things that subsists in, uh, I think, in all the writing, but it, it, there's there's a, there's a shift in in style, and I think it's it's very important for Balash that he retains the form of he retains some of the forms of film criticism. So his writing is very essayistic and impressionistic, aphoristic, um, poetic. Um, and I think, for me, that's one of the ways in which I was kind of struck with some of the parallels with Altine and the way he writes about performance yesterday, that, that it's that that allows him to put the actor right at the center of his theory. And he says at the beginning of Visible Man that um, the director and the actor are together the protagonists of the history of, of film language. Um, so I think there's something also, there's something that, that has to be looked at about what happens to the language of the critic as you move from criticism into theory, that to see what that language enables and what's retained from criticism, what gets lost in this kind of um, formulation of a, of a theoretical apparatus. And also, I know Jim has a question, and I we don't want to monopolize the conversation, but um, the object also may be different in degree so just to give you one more tidbit um, uh, from Kale, she more or less concludes her review by saying, you know, in, in her exasperated tone, she's like, Kakawa must think we read books on the movies to get our knowledge of history and philosophy. <laughs> to which you want to answer, yeah, of course. That's exactly <laughs> what he wants. So um, film theory is that. Now that's not to set up a rigid delimitation because I think film criticism, when it's good, is also that. Um, but I think it's completely legitimate for film theory to be also about other things than particular films. So it's, in that sense, it's a generic issue. Uh, well, thank you very much for this panel. Uh, everything is very interconnected. Uh, a quick informational questions and then a somewhat longer point, uh, a little bit longer point. Uh, one was, uh, uh, I, I was curious what kind of journals uh, Balash was writing for in the 20s. Uh, second, and this is pretty arcane, I was curious whether Krakauer ever wrote at length on People on Sunday. And the, uh, um, if you came across that in, when you're going through his, yeah, yeah, yeah. his writings. And, and the other one is that I'm, I'm interested in, in uh, your notion of um, uh, film perfection, and I wonder if you might not push some of these things a little further. I mean, first of all, you mentioned Vertov. Vertov spoke about a film object. Yeah which takes you know, movies from something transcendental to something material, something closer to sculpture. And Benjamin, even though he, he came up with this notion of perfection in the, in the work of art in the age of mechanical reproduction, is basically saying that uh, he's arguing against the notion whether it's photography and art, just saying that photography has changed the nature of art. Yeah. So if you jump ahead then uh, uh, a few decades, you come across somebody who, you mentioned the uh, perfectionist filmmaker. I would suggest that Andy Warhol was the imperfectionist filmmaker. Right. And the movies that he made mm -hmm. in the early 60s in particular were a priori perfect. In other words, Poor Little Rich Girl is perfect because he set up the situation and he decided to show it. This is also true of, of certain found films. And mm -hmm. the most important one would be the film that, uh, that Ken Jacobs presented made up of TV outtakes 
of, uh, you know, based around the uh, assassination of Malcolm X, which, is, yeah. which he then decided to call perfect film. <laughs> Uh, the Balas Journal. The ba yeah, the, the Balas Journals. I mean, he he when he went into exile in Vienna, he started writing for the Austrian daily Der Tag and became the first um, first the first film critic. Full stop. But the first film critic for Der Tag. Um, but he was also writing for other newspapers. So he wrote, wrote for the Zürcher Zeitung, for example. He was writing for. He was a newspaper critic. He was also a jobbing writer. So he wrote screenplays, he wrote plays, he wrote fairy stories, he wrote opera libretti, radio plays, and so on. He was a writer, really. Um, I think there's an interesting shift that happens, or, or some, a place where he starts to write a little bit uh, when he moves to Berlin in the mid-1920s is a really interesting journal, which I think there hasn't been enough work done on, called Film Technik, um, which was um, a journal launched by Guido Zeba, and then it, then it, um, it ends up being edited by Andor Krasner Krauss, who goes to the UK in exile and sets up focal press um, and that's it's a really interesting journal because it brings together cinematographers like Karl Freund is writing there, Rudolf Arnheim is writing, Balash writes in, in film technique, practitioners, lighting, you know, lighting technicians, cinematographers and so on are writing about the craft of film in the context of a discussion also about the criticism and theory of film. So, so that, that's, that's an interesting, also perhaps an answer to Rick's question about the move from criticism to theory. It also happens through a series of publications that one doesn't quite see in the same form now. So that would be interesting. Yes, he wrote about people on Sunday. <laughs> 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 I, 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 I actually can't remember right now. It's receding into the massive. Do you, does as any of you remember reading that one in particular? Well, you know, I don't, not, 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 not a standalone essay. It's, 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 it's not even a standalone essay. Especially, yeah. especially if you read backwards and right. you see his deep commitment and investment in Tosika and company and you would think that he would have written no, but in the reviews, yeah. in the reviews, I, I don't, I, I don't, I, I, it's, yeah, it's in there, yeah, it's, it's in there. And um, I thought it's an excellent um, question and point that you um, that you raised and made. And I think one of the things that unites all the different commentators whom I was addressing, uh, despite all their ideological differences, was a commitment to materialism, of course, um, that unites obviously Krakauer and Balash as well as some uh, form of Marxism, um, however tenuous or idiosyncratic it might have been. And certainly it's something that Panofsky then later writes in his famous essay from 47 um, on style and medium and motion pictures, um, that film, of course, unlike all prior media except for photography, um, has this materialist element, which is that it starts from the bottom up, that it records aspects of material reality as opposed to the kind of top down um, coming from the idealist, the kind of idealist idea that it comes from the head of the artist and then um, finds concrete material form. And so um, certainly that is one of the things that contributes to the problematic of perfection um, when we talk about cinema, is that it always deals with the messy empirical um, reality. Um, and that's partly what I think is so fascinating about Krakauer then, is that he'll say, and um, contradicting a long line of um, uh, Western philosophers, that um, uh, it's precisely in the contingencies of the empirical world that something like a kind of poetics of film might actually um, emerge. But certainly the idea of the imperfect film is something that fascinates me. Um, and uh, it gets, you know, oftentimes reduced to this issue of continuity errors or goofs on IMDb or whatever. And, um, but I think you're absolutely right to point to certain films that make that um, a kind of central subject. And the essay film would be another excellent example, which has this kind of messy, very self-consciously messy aesthetic. I, I'd love to talk to you more about that. Thank you. I'm captivated by the comment that if you get exhausted with the everyday criticism that you turn to theory. And I think the, the, the discussions even from yesterday have made me constantly think about what is critique. And in the flow of unlimited images and unlimited information, I'm constantly uh, preoccupied with the idea of how to decide what to focus on with students or at any particular moment. When do you stop and say, this is worth looking at, this is worth ta talking about? So the critic. I think some of yesterday's discussion, the critic is somebody who's either angry or has a position, and this person has experience and you need to listen to them. And there's a reason to read critics for that. Then there's the person who can tell you the general things that are going on that are important because this is typical of this kind of film or whatever. But I'm captivated by the images Erica showed because they seem to do a lot of things at the same time. I'm wondering, 
what made them go viral is it aesthetic composition, the skill of the photographer, are these named photographers who should be credited or sometimes are, and is that also only at the other end of the spectrum from images that go viral because they are moments where somebody is angry, there is something crystallized in the moment of politics and imagery that does make it stop and makes millions of people click on it. And are those, are those connected or are they the two sides of what uh, Johannes was talking about? I have no idea why that <laughs> image went viral. Um, <laughs> I think there have to be lots and lots of reasons. I won't speculate very much, but one of the things that I that um, I'm uh, that um, Nassim Iqbal talks about in the Guardian, she talks about the ordina ordinariness of Safiya Khan just standing um, and um, not adopting a posture. There's no rage, for example, in her posture, and perhaps that's important. It's it's a recognizable body. Maybe that's it. That it's a recognizable body, and I th I think that's where that does become a question for media criticism or film criticism. The, the, the question is not so much about what is this body, but the question is what makes it recognizable. Um, and you know, what's the history of that recognizability? Um, so maybe that's an answer. <laughs> I don't know. It, it prompts me to, uh, I, but I don't want to really go too far down this road, but it prompts me to a reflection about the distinction between, again, Fatima's title, film criticism and film scholarship. And that film scholarship, if I see our field correctly, now I'm talking as a film, film scholar, has moved away from the notion of textual analysis, mm -hmm. right? That's, you don't do courses on that anymore, and uh, it's media industries rather than film analyses that we that we teach. And you can't hire people anymore who do, you know, who read bodies of films. That's uh, that's at least my experience administratively right now in in the field. Now, I never stopped to think about that development in relationship to film criticism, which is a continuing and important art form, in my opinion. And uh, that, that, that there's no question that that's textual analysis, right? So, um, but that's, that's just a kind of meta reflection on your question about what is it in an image that arrests us? Is, you know, so the film scholar would say, well, it's the, uh, you know, the ecology of uh, YouTube and the, um, the, 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 the economy of, mm -hmm. Uh, of Google and you know, algorithms and clicks, et cetera, um, and the, 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 the critic of the image, Bach, would say it's the punctum. Mm. It's in the, it's in, see? <laughs> are, aren't those photographs like a, a, an example of a privileged moment that you were speaking about, except it's, mm. it's, yeah. it's being disseminated in a completely other way, and mm. almost automatically, which mm. seems very photographic as well. Mm. Mm. It's what Lessing would have argued about sculpture in the in the 18th century. <laughs> you got to capture that moment, and then that's it. Right? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, yeah, thank you. And and we've gone over, and I think <laughs> we're going to continue this dialogue. It's been a great panel. Thanks so much. <laughs>